Welcome to Altus Insights podcast series with Ray and Marlin, hosted by me, Avi. This podcast will cover monthly market updates and construction cost impacts across major markets in Canada. We kick off our new podcast series with a two-parter where we'll be discussing the ongoing impact of the pandemic on real estate activity and construction costs with retrospectives on 2021, predictions for 2022, and market trends everyone should keep an eye on. Let's get started. I'm the Director of Business Development at Altus Group, and I'm very fortunate to have here today with me two of my colleagues and top industry experts, Ray Wong, VP of Data Operations, and Marlon Bray, Manager of Stuff, also known as Senior Director of Cost Consulting. I'm just going to dive right in and start by asking Ray a question about the market activity. Ray, 2021 was a record year for commercial investment activity in Canada. What were the market drivers and are prices increasing? Yeah, and good question, Evie. Um, 2021, I'm not sure if it was sort of anomaly because it, it is, the, the, the demand started at the end of um, um, 2020 based on a bit of a hesitation with the um, w- with pandemic. So a lot of the sales that we saw in 2021 were supposed to happen in 2020. So that's why the the overall activity um, hit over um, 70 billion, uh, you know, 35 over 35 percent over our, our last record year in 2019. And it's it's it was it, it was a shift as well because pre pandemic you had. The natural leaders with apartment, land, and office, and again because of the shift with, with um, the office sector, the and the growth of e-commerce, it was really driven by the demand for product for industrial, land still, and mainstay, and as well as apartment. But what was this? Not, I guess not so much a surprise was the continuous um, um, sort of flow of uh, investment um, activity on on the retail side, despite all the discussions with the the, the survivability of of uh, retail brick and mortar. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that going into twenty twenty too, um, with with the aspect of continued strong demand, because there's a lot of capital out there. But we're probably going to see continuation of price increases on the apartment side and industrial side, just because of lack of product and very low vacancy rates, you know, less than 2% for both those those, uh, product types. And but we're probably going to see sort of a, a flattening on office. Um, and as well as um, on, on the retail side. But definitely with core assets, they're still going to fetch a premium, and we we'll probably will see for core assets continue uh, uh, lowered cap rates. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, you answered my next question, which was going to be if you see this continuing in 2022. So basically you're saying that, yes, you expect a continuation of these trends? Absolutely. Interesting. Thank you, Ray. And uh, what about on the res side? What can you say about the res side in the GTA? Well, you've seen the newspapers. Uh, it's been a record year for 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 housing, and um, yeah, definitely there's a shortage of of, of housing. And uh, it's 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 sort of the, the the single family and as well as the apartment uh, condominium side. And there's definitely a shortage in. Um, in, in single family, and as well as that's where we saw most of the the price increases. Um, and condo um, apartments have increased in both activity and price, but not to the same level as single family. And I think it's, it's just going to continue because we have the the same challenges with um, the short supply, and you're, we're also adding the element of immigration sort of returning in 2022. So I think we're going to see a continued trend and a continu- continued sort of shortage of, of uh, product and pushing prices up higher. Interesting. That's good. And I'm going to circle back after and ask a few more questions on the res side, but just to uh, look at construction costs for a bit. Marlon, we know COVID has caused some labor shortages, supply chain challenges, and changes in material costs. Can you tell us a bit more about the key factors behind the extreme levels of cost ex- escalation experienced in 2021? No problem at all. But first, it's uh, Valentine's Day when the podcast goes out. So happy Valentine's Day, everyone. And if you wish to send me flowers, there'll be a link at the end of the podcast. 
Um, in terms of COVID and the impact on escalation, there is to a degree, but however, to raise earlier point on supply and demand, the supply and demand is probably a larger impact in terms of the volume of work in the markets. I mean, if you were to look at pressure on escalation, COVID is probably between a third and a half any one time, depending on the particular impact. And it's not really necessarily COVID, it's that pandemic and the disruption to the supply chain. Um, the supply chain is in essence broken, could be fixed by the end of 2022. We could be looking at 2023 until it resolves itself. Obviously, the storms in BC uh, made the issue a lot stronger in Canada in that most of the stuff that's shipped from Asia comes via Vancouver port or it comes via the Montreal port if it um, comes from Europe. Add on to that the well-documented fun everyone's having with the truckers right now, which is in the news. And it, it really makes it a very... <laughs> very frothy market, so to speak. Uh, I think David Skunian said it once. It's uh, like the world's biggest game of whack-a-mole. Once you solve one problem and you hit it, another one appears. Um, and that's going to carry on. And that that does show itself in labor, uh, both skilled labor and professional labor, as well as production labor, in that factories are struggling to work full shift, keep up with demand due to COVID five-day isolations. Site is impacted as well by COVID with the five-day isolation period. Some sites are down to about 70% um, of the crews. Um, and then adding to that, the general shortage that we have for volume of work in the overall market, um, retirements, uh, lack of replacement, and the immigration system not being set up to support workers. And then um, the solutions are basically around training, which takes time and technology, and more so increased participation in the industry. Um, for example, female participation in the, uh, the white collar side or the office side is somewhere in the region of 40, 45% of the industry, but on site it's as low as 5%. And then in increasing indigenous participation. And then, as I mentioned, trying to fix the immigration, which uh, isn't ideally suited right now in terms of the point system to bringing in skilled workers focused on the shortages in construction. That's great. That's really interesting. You actually taught me something new, uh, so I appreciate that. So you basically said for the next year or two, you are expecting the trends to sustain probably up until 2023. And then we should see some costs going down a bit, some of these challenges being resolved. I Is mean, that that, that's generally the, the, the hope. And that's across pretty much most of the markets. Um, Vancouver is ramping up right now, has a bunch of large mixed use projects. So it's probably going to go into at least 2023, maybe 2024. Um, Toronto was riding a high wave since 2016, and that hasn't slowed down. And we did have, Ray mentioned, uh, extremely high sales uh, this year, especially in the condo market, and rentals continue to go at a clip, um, as well as a, a significant amount of industrial under construction. So the, also, we have large scale infrastructure in the GTA coming on board. So it should slow down because we do expect condo sales to start slowing. Um, next year, they'll still be solid. The year after is probably going to slow down a little bit more as, uh, uh, as inclusion rezoning starts to take a bite out of the market. Um, and then when you go to Montreal, we actually thought Montreal would slow down a little earlier. However, there's been a, a significant surge in purposeful rental in that market. So again, it's probably going to push that out a little bit. In theory, 2024 should be a little bit slower than we're seeing now. However, there's I don't think there's a guarantee of that. Um, for example, even Calgary, that's traditionally been very slow on escalations, actually the, the market's picking up relative to where it's been previously and starting to show some signs of strength as well. Um, even places like Halifax and whatnot are very, very busy. So it's a, it's a Canada-wide issue that's definitely through this year, most likely into next year. And it, it would not shock me if the first half of 2024 is busy. That's interesting. That's great. Thank you so much, Marlon. And you mentioned industrial, which is a perfect segue to my next question for Ray. Uh, so we know that sky, that industrial sale and lease rates have been skyrocketing. Are tenants able to stay competitive in this market? What are your thoughts on that? You know, what? It's, it, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to watch because there has been escalation and we've all seen escalation in, in, in prices. Um, uh, on, the, on, the, on the retail side. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a combination of increased land prices. Like uh, a, a few years ago, you can pick up an acre in, um, in Mississauga around you know, one and a half million. Now you're looking at two, um, 2.2, 2.3 million uh, an acre. And that's, and that's sort of a conservative number. And as well as in addition to what Marlon mentioned about construction costs, you're looking at... Um, increase sort of the sophistication of, of, of buildings, uh, definitely with, um, you know, uh, 
floors that can handle the higher rocking, higher higher ceiling heights. So it's really driven up the 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 price, the, both the sale price and as well as the lease rates. And it'd be interesting with um, tenants on uh, how they sort of adjust. They have to be close to their their customers and, and be close to the urban area, uh, urban area, just just so they can um, meet the same day or next day delivery. But we all, we've also seen a bit of a shift. I and mean, we've seen the shift, not just in Toronto, but as well as in, in, in Montreal, where they're, they're moving out um, out of the, 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 the 416 and into sort of the secondary and tertiary markets. The one cheaper land. And the challenge we, before by locating a, a warehouse distribution in sort of the, the smaller markets, you didn't really have the labor. Now the focus is on automation. And as well as based on what we've seen on the housing affordability, people are moving out to the, the secondary tertiary markets, and especially um, down the 401 corridor in southwestern Ontario and what we're seeing with, um, with um, on the eastern side of um, Durham region. So now you have the labor force out there as well. So it's a little bit more palatable for, for some of these companies to locate out there at lower cost and still maintain their operation. But for some, the, the challenge remains in uh, the urban area for for cost standpoint. But again, you're, you're, you're watching companies pivot um, and they're pivoting quite well based on with existing facilities or older facilities raising the roof, increasing capacity. So increasing capacity without um, um, renting more space um, and, and as well as with with um, uh, sort of um, new new locations. So I think it's going to be a challenge going forward, but companies are starting to adapt to the new price environment. Interesting. And since we're talking about these secondary and tertiary markets and with the whole work from home migration, how do you see the demand for commercial development in those markets? How do you think they'll follow? Well, I'm, I'm hoping Marlon backs me up on this, but we're, we're starting to see more activity, uh, especially with some of the, the industrial component and even the office component in a place like Kelowna. And um, with with the increase in number of people and the flexibility of, of being um, you know, in close proximity of, of Vancouver is, is, is looking at um, additional services. And if you look at a place like Hamilton, right? The, the, the movement out there started about 10, 15 years ago for housing affordability. So a lot of those people moved out there and were commuting back into this to Toronto, but a lot of them now are sort of either starting their own um, companies or some companies have moved out there to benefit from one of the lower rents as well as getting at that that talent pool that is a bit of a shortage, especially on the tech side. So we're definitely seeing the secondary tertiary markets, like what Marlon said earlier, regards to Halifax. You have great affordability, great universities, and as well as um, uh, good connectivity with with uh, with the major markets. So I see places like Halifax, Kelowna, and we're already seeing, seeing for a while with respect to Ottawa and the secondary tertiary markets, I think they're going to continue to grow even past the pandemic because I think that's sort of a trend, especially when you look at housing affordability. That's interesting. And and looking at, you know, those secondary markets and then, you know, the urban main market, uh, you know, like the downtown Toronto market. And this was actually going to be a question I asked you earlier. So I'll ask you now. Uh, so at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a lot of people leave their condos downtown to get larger spaces and go to those outskirts. Now that we're entering year three into the pandemic. Uh, so not only did we see some people leave, but we saw less population coming in. But now that trend has slowly shifted from my understanding. So what are you seeing on the in the condo market in Toronto? I think, you know, I'm a big believer of um, urban and and downtown. So it, we started to see pe people sort of uh, move back. Um, and you saw that in the rental market um, last summer or last spring in anticipation of return to the office and a certain level of normalcy. So that was sort of coming back with, um, especially with, with people that, that really like that, being able to walk or, or take a short public transit in, into the office and close to restaurants and, and retail. So I think we're still gonna, the, the, the activity 
for um, apartment condos in the downtown has picked up. Again, nowhere uh, close to the same pace as single family and you know, that's sort of affordability standpoint. So I think we're going to see it probably so, sort of a continuation, but not to the same extent as we, we saw with the single family, because I think there's still a demand in that area. And I also a uh, strong believer of, of uh, the downtown will eventually, um, um, people will start going back into the office and there will be that, that demand to be to live at least closer to um, where you work. Yeah, because I, I think on um, the, the two points you've made earlier as well, the push out of Toronto has started before the pandemic. It just accelerated to a degree uh, with yeah. people chasing affordability. And I think there was a, a larger degree of flexibility in the work environment even before the pandemic. Again, obviously, it accelerated into an abnormal environment will calm down. I think part of the challenge is going forward is going to be a question of affordability. Um, as the rates in those outer areas, or I, I'm not sure if they're even outer areas, like Vaughan and what now are over, over $1,100 a square foot for a condo. So is that any more affordable? How far out do you go to hit affordability? I think the other challenge you have around where people are going to choose to live and where development's going to be is that project economics is starting to get really challenged now, especially in Toronto itself. Um, we mentioned earlier inclusion rezoning. It's really going to be interesting to see how inclusion rezoning works its way out in the market because it really is a huge negative disincentive. It's not an enabler to development. And whether or not people then just push development away from where inclusion rezoning happens around the transit hubs and starts to push even more into the tertiary market just because they're the markets where you can actually make sense and the economics. Because I think one of the things often... Um, confuses a lot of people or the expectation is if you look at revenue, it's more than doubled, say, since 2016. That return on cost has not doubled. If anything, the return on cost tends to return back to norm very quickly with the number of challenges that are in the market. Now, we know stuff always happens and we figure it out and the market's very entrepreneurial. Um, but I'd say inclusion zoning is the new one that we genuinely have a, a much larger concern than we've had historically with the pile on with levies and fees. I mean, in an average condo now, anywhere between 20-25% of the cost basically is the government's cut. Uh, the developer takes less than half of that, and the developer's in for eight years. So I do think this, I do think there'll be there'll be an impact on where people choose to live on that availability of what product is going to be there. And part of that will be driven by affordability in the future as well. So it's interesting that you brought it up because I was actually going to ask you what your thoughts were on the inclusionary zoning and whether you think it's going to solve that affordability crisis. So it sounds like you're saying not as much as... Uh... It's going to solve nothing. It's going to make it worse. It actually defies any form of logic as a, as a, a policy to enact to increase affordable housing. It entirely removes the developer's ability to be entrepreneurial and provide affordable housing in a form that makes financial sense. Even if that's not a profit, it's only a cost. Inclusion zoning doesn't allow for that sort of um, entrepreneurial approach to keep using the same word. It just hammers in rules again. If you go to other jurisdictions where inclusion rezoning has been done, there's examples where there's density benefits, so increased density can provide it, again, an enabling policy. Or there could be offsets against DCs for the affordable portion. There can be offsets in tax. Um, I believe on LinkedIn yesterday, I saw someone had posted an article about inclusion rezoning. I think it was Portland, but I wouldn't quote me on that, or somewhere in the US. Um, it di inclusion rezoning directly led to a decrease in total development and affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Right now, with the supply and demand imbalance we have in the GTA, it's a ludicrous position to take that we could be actually decreasing supply. And again, it's making the market less affordable. Um, at, I was on a conference call the other day, and as someone said, uh, Canada doesn't have a lack of land supply. Canada has an approval problem, and it's the approval side that's causing the rapid increases in rates and that lack of ability to actually bring product to the market. I mean, I think the low rise would be the prime example in the GTA. There's less than a 1,000 homes available for, for sale on the new home side. We got over 6 million people. As a ratio, that seems a little ludicrous. No, no wonder the benchmark price has gone crazy. And it's that sort of that sort of restriction on the ability to develop um, that I think is leading to a lot of the challenges. And the pandemic has made it cloudy for a little bit, but that return to normal with population increases, immigration, um, Ontario uh, is going to be hot. Uh, and I know we're talking a lot on the GTA now, but it, it, it's the similar sort of issues we've seen in Montreal with the 2020 that they've looked at. And these continual pile on with these solutions for affordability that 
the the short term fix is that um, people are just going in for the easy. I get fifteen minutes on TV. I get my five minutes on social media, rather than someone stepping up and making a real big decision on the solving of the housing crisis, which isn't just a Canadian issue. You see the same the same issue in a number of U.S. cities. You see the same issue in Europe as well. This isn't a, a made in Toronto or a made in Vancouver or a made in Montreal problem. This is a G7 issue, with the exception of Japan. The uniqueness of Japan is the federal government controls their zoning. Yeah, that's interesting. And it makes me think, because uh, we actually discussed this last week, and I believe it was in 2018, but Ray, correct me if I'm wrong. In 2018, there was a record-breaking year in terms of cancelled condo projects. I believe there were 17 to 18 cancelled projects. And I remember a lot of people in the media got really frustrated, and they said it's because of developer greed and whatnot. Uh, but I think we discussed a bit about how, you know, with the delayed approvals and the increased costs, sometimes the performers just don't work and developers can't get those loans. So can you guys tell me a little bit more about what happens with those development applications that don't get approved or now with the inclusionary zoning? Will it affect uh, those performers? Will it create more canceled projects? What are your thoughts? Do you want me to go right to you? I mean, inclusionary zoning is not going to cause more council projects because you'd be aware of inclusionary zoning on your pro forma before you underwrote the project. Um, cancellations, the cancellations that were that happened before 2018, so until 2016, were largely caused by projects that, that is sort of failed the sales test. They didn't make it to the 70% threshold. Those projects were cancelled. Once we hit 2017, we had a record escalation year, 10% construction cost escalation. We had people that unfortunately sold, say, two years ago at sub $600 a square foot. Escalation was rampant. And in essence, the, with the slow approvals process not being able to get in the ground quickly, that project quickly went from, say, um, a low double-digit returning to single-digit returns. And, and a number of them actually got very close to even negative or zero, at which point um, a lending facility or a bank is not going to is not going to advance you the money. Um, the cancellations we've seen since 2017 have largely been actually projects that have sold much more higher percentage of sales. And, and it's basically they've got stuck in approvals and the escalation at five, seven, 10 percent year after year after year. Um, it, it doesn't take more than two years before a project can have significant financial challenges. And there are tactics that developers have adopted. Um, taking it to the pre-sales threshold of, say, 70%, holding back the rest, selling those later, hopefully at a higher price to act as a contingency, and, and be much more aggressive getting through the approvals process. The challenge you have on the approvals process is that slowed during the pandemic. Um, unfortunately, we've seen working from home is not always easy. You can, ima you can imagine every municipality has had to flip to a similar form of working, and it, it is tough to work from home. It's not, it's not quite the same. So that approval process has slowed down even more. Um, the, I don't know whether or not it's a staffing question, it's a funding question, uh, but it's something that needs resolving extremely quickly because the, the average length of approvals in, uh, in Toronto in particular, it's starting to border on the farce in terms of the length of time. Um, I have a slide I do in some of the market presentations, um, and I was doing a, an interesting way of measuring how long it takes for a project to get finished from the day we did our first pro forma. And most of them are like eight, nine years. So it's eight and nine years to get to final occupancy and the, the biggest chunks up front, just getting it approved versus actually building it. So you're getting those single digit higher single digit returns and you get eight years of risk. So it's the cancellations aren't caused by greed. I personally don't think I've ever seen any project canceled because of greed. Most of them is that financial viability and it's the inability to actually secure financing. And uh, despite popular opinion, developers don't sit around, sit around with hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank account ready to just fund an entire project to lose money. Mm -hmm. And, and to, to Marlon's point, I, I think a lot of the developers right now are, 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 are definitely smarter, are a lot more aware of potential increased um, costs for, for some of the projects and built into their performance. But it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a concern, but we haven't seen, again, that level of, a, of activity with, with cancellations. And I think as, as we go forward and, and um, understand what, the, what you know, further costs, uh, escalations, and how they impact those projects, that is sort of a wait and see, but it's definitely with the increase in, in prices that we've seen, and we're, and we're, we're seeing that with uh, the land transactions as, as well, and whether or not it actually makes it feasible sort of going forward. So it's still a wait and see, but it, it, it is a bit of a concern going forward. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that's really interesting and really insightful. And I hope uh, many will listen it and watch this because, you know, I had some confusion around that. So you guys really helped me understand that whole process. So thank you for that. Thank you for tuning into part one of our discussion on the continuing impact of the pandemic on the real estate market. Don't miss part two, where we'll discuss commercial investment activity and dive deeper into construction cost impacts and share perspectives on the rapidly evolving market. While you're waiting for part two of our podcast to air, make sure you register for our national state of the market webinar that we'll be hosting on February 24th. Ray Wong and Peter Norman, chief economists at Altus Group, will share market updates and insights from 2021. Please find the registration link for this highly anticipated presentation in the episode description. Additionally, our newly released 2022 Canadian Construction Cost Guide is now available and we've shared a download link to this extremely popular annual publication in the description of this episode. Thank you again for listening and please stay tuned for our next podcast.